Hello and a very warm welcome to our session today as we gather together around the Word of God on the Doncaster Methodist Circuit YouTube channel. As we find ourselves for the third time since last Wednesday looking at a short passage from the end of Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 to 42. But before we go into the passage let's have a short prayer together. So let us pray. Loving God, we gather in response to your invitation. We gather together, welcomed by you. May the warmth of your welcome inspire and enhance the worship we offer to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So last Wednesday we were on Matthew 10 verses 40 to 42. If you were with us on Sunday, you'll know that we were well, the same passage, we came at it from a different angle. And we're coming at it from a third angle today, as we read it once more. So here's the passage. Anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Amen. So when we were talking about this passage last Wednesday, we were talking about the unsung heroes of the faith. When we were talking about it on Sunday, we focused on the welcome that we would have loved to have given during lockdown into our buildings, but we weren't able to. Then we remembered that, in any case, it's not so much welcoming those who come at the moment, it's about going uh, to those who welcome us, perhaps into their homes. Today I wanted to focus upon a word that appears three times in the passage, and a word in, in some ways that can confuse us, uh, because it's the word reward. It appears three times. Jesus talks about people receiving uh, their reward. And in some ways, it's problematic for us to think in terms of reward or punishment, for that matter, for a, a couple of reasons. The first one is this. Perhaps you've never thought about it before, but... In many ways, talk about reward or punishment makes the whole business of ethics or doing good for its own sake uh, a little difficult. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've probably told you before about when I was a, a child, probably before the age of 10, on a Sunday morning, my dad would uh, usher me into the garden and together we'd start digging over the vegetable patch. And my feelings of, oh, isn't this lovely, my dad is doing something with me, uh, was usually very short-lived. Because after he'd set me off for about 10 minutes digging alongside me, he'd say, right, I'm off to the pub, and by the time I get back, I expect you to finish this patch. Well, I'd labour away, and invariably the next-door neighbour would start looking over the fence. And he'd say something to me along these lines. Uh, I guess he was just trying to be nice and perhaps he had pity on me, but uh, he'd say something like this. Ooh, I bet your dad's promised you something for doing that, haven't he? hasn't he? And, and I'd look up at him and I'd probably look a bit cross, I guess. And uh, I'd say, no, but he's promised me something if I don't. Well, whatever my father had promised me, whether it was in terms of reward or punishment, if he'd promised me either of those things, he would have taken away the opportunity for me to do the good thing, that is, dig in the vegetable patch, uh, for his own sake. Because in some ways, I, I wouldn't have been that concerned about doing good. I'd have had my eyes more on the reward. Uh, I wouldn't have been so concerned about not doing it. I'd have been more fearful of the punishment uh, if I hadn't. I hope you can understand where we're going with this. Uh, the old talk of reward makes doing good for its own sake uh, a very difficult 
thing to do. I remember, I think it was in my 20s, I, I read a book by a Danish theologian named Søren Kierkegaard. Uh, you're, just in case you wondered, I, I read it in English. I could hardly understand it in English, let alone in Danish. Um, nonetheless, uh, it, it was a book where, in English, had a very interesting title. It was called, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. Purity of Heart is to Will One Thing. And some of the book is about the fact that we have a divided heart very often. And I guess what it boils down to is ulterior motives. And it's when, basically, uh, we're not just doing good for its own sake, but, as I say, we have the eye, eye on the reward or the punishment. And I didn't understand a lot of the book. I, I very rarely understand theologians when I, I read them as the primary source. Uh, I can just about understand them sometimes if I read a book about them and about what they've written. Uh, but reading what they've written in the first place, it takes me to the limits of my understanding very often. But I did understand this bit. And it's when um, he's talking about uh, a rich woman who has taken a lover. But every night she's troubled by this worry and this niggling doubt in her mind. Does he love me for who I am? Or does he love me for what I've got? What if God ever feels like that about us? Does this person love me for who I am? Or does he love me for what he thinks he can get out of me? Either the reward of heaven or uh, the avoidance uh, of punishment. Whatever it is, purity of heart is to will one thing and it is to love the lover for the lover's sake. To do the good thing for the sake of doing good without one eye on one thing uh, or the other. But the other problem, of course, that reward has for us uh, as Christians is we don't believe in reward in that sense, do we? We, we believe that we're justified by faith and, and through grace. That our salvation would, is a, a free gift from God. It can't be earned, it can't be deserved, it can't be given to us as any kind of reward. It's just simply free. And Jesus dies on the cross for us at Calvary so that we can have the free gift of peace with God, so we can have the free gift of sins forgiven, so we can have the free gift of life eternal. So it's problematic for us to hear Jesus talking uh, about reward uh, in this kind of way, because surely uh, he of all people knows that we are saved by grace, we're justified by faith. But there are some things in life, aren't there, where the reward is actually just built in. It's not that you're trying to earn it. It's just there. Um, if you've ever done an hour's exercise, you may not have looked forward to it. it may have been painful while you were doing it, but I bet once you've finished, uh, you've experienced a built-in reward uh, for that exercise. Not only the reward, perhaps of uh, a smaller waistline, uh, stronger legs, but nature itself, it, it releases these things called endorphins, doesn't it? And the endorphins actually give you all a shot of uh, well-being and, uh, and good feelings. So that's one thing. that You may not do it for the reward of the endorphins, but it's just built into it. Uh, and some things in life, the reward is simply uh, built in. You may have thought, oh, it's late, tired. Can I really face phoning that person who's perhaps ill or, or lonely and it feels something like a, of an irksome duty. But you do it and again, you may feel a bit irritated at the time, but once you put the phone down, once you've heard the pleasure in that person's voice, after you've enjoyed the conversation, the reward was simply just built in. Uh, there's a saying, isn't it, that service uh, is its own reward, and, and there's such a lot of truth in that, isn't there? So, although there are problems with the reward, if you've got your eye on that, uh, rather than just doing a good thing for its own sake, there's a problem with the notion of reward when you're a Christian who believes 
that you're saved by grace and justified by faith. But some things in life just simply do have reward built into them. I've given you a few examples. I wonder if as you go through the day, through the week perhaps, you might spot some other examples for yourself. You might sort of just have that feeling of satisfaction, self-fulfillment, a pleasure, even perhaps some of those lovely endorphins we've been talking about. And, and you'll go in that moment, oh, I know now just what Tom was talking about because I'm just experiencing it for myself. See how you get on during the day and during the week. But in the meantime, let's share again in those prayers that go with this passage that we uh, shared together this time last week. And uh, if you were with us last week, you might remember that I say the words, may they know they are welcome in your kingdom. And you respond by saying, may they know the welcome of your love. So let us pray. We pray for those on the fringes of society, for those who feel rejected, for those who are overlooked, for those whom others avoid. May they know they are welcome in your kingdom. May they know the welcome of your love. We pray for those who are lonely. May they know they are welcome in your kingdom. May they know the welcome of your love. We pray for those in prison, especially those kept in isolation. May they know they are welcome in your kingdom. May they know the welcome of your love. We pray for children excluded from school, for their families and those with responsibility for their education. May they know they are welcome in your kingdom. May they know the welcome of your love. Loving God, as you welcome us, may we welcome others with warmth and steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>